Hello, nice to see you again. I hope you're doing fine. Um, today we are talking uh, in following this really nice lecture about maternal uh, vaccination and you already heard a little bit about the neonate at the infant. Um, we are talking about uh, now the vaccination in early life. And so if you look at the class objectives for um, this 25 minutes, um, at the end you should be able to explain why vaccination in early life is important. I think that's going to be an easy one. And then you should be able to discuss the basic principles that shape early life immune responses. So you should be able to cite some of the specific requirements at um, different stages in early life, some regulatory mechanisms, and the early life germinal center responses. And again, to do allusions to last um, Tuesday, um, you will talk about now the milk bar, right? Because it's uh, early life. And um, all this is kind of an introduction uh, to the next presentation that you're going to have after the coffee break from uh, Edwin, uh, who talks about um, the infant and early life vaccine schedules. And so these concepts you will use then um, in the next talk uh, and apply this to different vaccine schedules. So um, you have all heard about this several times now, and this is another way of showing you uh, how vulnerable um, children are in early life to infections. Um, and here you see, unfortunately, there's no newer data than these from 2015, um, but you see the map uh, of the world with different colors and the under five mortality rate. So the more you are light, the lower they are, and the more you are orange, um, the higher the, the under five um, mortality rate is. And you see in some countries, it's uh, up to 20%. Um, and so if we kind of uh, put numbers on it, and it's like very gray zone numbers, so there's many more, but you could say that there is um, around 5.3 million deaths uh, of children under the age of five every year. Um, you see mostly neonates and then infants, um, which I define until the age of one. There's different definitions, but for the sake of the talk, it's um, until the age of one. And then 1.3 million age one to four. And the um, sad thing about all this is that half of these would be preventable or potentially preventable by vaccination. So this is why vaccination in early life is important. So to understand the struggles of early life vaccination, I think we have to understand a little bit the early life immune responses. And I would like to start um, with a question to all of you, and please don't look at the slides, right, if you already, if they are unhidden now. Um, but I would like to ask, is the early life immune system uh, immature? And so who says yes? And who says no? So a lot of yes. And little no. I'm really glad that I can be with you this morning. <laughs> so what I'm going to show you now is um, at different uh, types of early, like at different stages of early life, the baby or the fetus faces different environments and faces also his immune system or her immune system, different requirements. No? So at the very early, when you have this fetus in the, um, here in the upper row, um, well, there is this kind of semi-allogenic status between the mother and the fetus, right? And the fetus has to do everything not to get kicked out by the mother. So they, the immune system has to suppress this kind of rejection and has to induce some of a tolerogenic uh, immune responses, which means, for example, regulatory T-cells. You don't have to go into the very detail, but you, you see the concept, no? We, we need not to be rejected. Then we are born the most stressful event in our life, like more stressful than moving or getting married. No? Um, and so here, what do we have to do? Um, so the, 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 the baby has to kind of do an inflammation that separates it from the layers with the mother, no? because we are connected by the placenta and these different layers. But then at the same time, if you do a huge immune response as a baby, we're going to die. No? So it has to be kind of located. And then the other thing that can happen, I mean, labor is always a hard thing, and then it's not fast enough. So we get hypoxic, and so we have not enough oxygen as a baby. And this is a huge stress again. And this also damages our tissue. And where we say tissue damage, we say inflammation. 
No? So this is kind of a, a very, very uh, challenging environment. So the baby has to prevent systemic inflammation. So needs to kind of immunosuppressively act, but not everywhere, right? So that's something. No? And then we are a newborn. And what happens? We come out of this kind of cozy uh, environment, all in liquid, more or less sterile. There's some you know, arguments, but more <laughs> sterile. And now there's all these bacteria everywhere. So we have to be careful not to react to everything, because if we think everything is an enemy, <laughs> then the inflammation is huge and we, we're going to die. So again, we, the baby needs to regulate the immune responses and kind of try to do some TH2 skewed response to re like decrease inflammation. So if I ask you again now, the early life immune system, is it immature? I mean, who dares to say yes now? <laughs> so no, it is not immature, but it is different because it's perfectly adapted to all the challenges that it's going to meet in a very short period of time, which is like days or weeks. No? So with this as a ground base, um, I would like to show you just some of these regulatory mechanisms and how things change. Not for you to keep them in mind, but just to have an idea how complex um, this early life immune system is. And so if you look at these regulatory mechanisms, you see the phase of the newborn, and then you see the phase between one and two years of life. And there is immunosuppressive molecules that decrease over time, and we have immunosuppressive cells um, that, uh, for example, like regulatory B cells or inhibitory fol follicular helper cell responses, no need to keep all of these in mind, but just to show you there's a lot at the beginning and then it decreases over time. And there's a huge regulation of T cell responses. So at the at first, um, we have a lot of regulatory um, T cells. And then by with time, um, we have more of an added like function with more balanced effector and, and T reg cells. And what is interesting is what is here in the very bottom. So you see the newborns have more of a Th2 skewed response. And then only slowly with time, we increase the Th1 cells. And these are the ones that are important uh, to target intracellular pathogens. And the Th17 cells, these are those for mucosal pathogens. And if we keep this in mind and then look at how infections are in early life. Then we see, if you have a newborn, it's basically very prone to severe infections of most pathogens because you saw it's very much regulated and there is very few cells able to intracellularly, extracellularly and um, to, to other pathogens. But mostly what we are afraid of is the extracellular bacteria like Staphylococcus, B Streptococcus, and Escherichia coli. So the neonatologists or pediatricians among you know the sepsis that we can have at this time. Then we have the infant. You remember? Still low Th1 and, and Th17. So here we have still very severe viral infections such as influenza and such as RSV. When we have heard a lot before about, about the RSV. Um, and some specific bacteria still like pertussis and encapsulated bacteria. Pertussis, you know, maternal vaccination, you have heard a lot about uh, about this. And then at toddler, we go more into adult-like resistance to viruses. And um, we slowly have a response to polysaccharides at the age of two. So we are more and more able to be resistant against these encapsulated bacteria. All this to show you the take home message, which is the threshold before an early life child is going to induce an immune response is higher. But then when it induces it, it, it can be really strong. That can be cytokine storms and it can be deleterious, this, this response. So this is just to have an idea about this, but how do we know all this immunology? And it's really difficult to do studies with human newborns, no? the amount of blood we can draw, and, and it's really complicated. So the data I'm going to show you afterwards that are related to vaccines 
they mostly come from mouse studies because neonatal mice immune responses and neonatal human immune responses uh, are kind of similar. And in summary, you see that upon antigen exposure and simulation, the neonates, they have very specific patterns of innate responses and an excess Th2 response, what I've showed you during several slides. No? And we have limited interferon gamma response and lower CD8 um, T cell response. So now when we talk about vaccines, most of the childhood vaccinations, they work by inducing B cells and antibodies, right? And so now I would like to show you how B cell responses are different in early life compared to what you have seen with Claran, uh, how the B cell response work in adults. So here you have this germinal center, the bar. You have here extracellular, extra follicular response. Here is the follicle. You have the antigen arriving, the antigen presenting cells, the T cell, B cell talk, and then they migrate into the germinal center. So one of the limitations, and I added all these sentences so you can come back to the slide when you need it. You don't have to keep this in mind now, but what you have to remember is the B cell activation is limited. So the strength of the B cell receptor, which is on the surface, the signaling is known to be lower, um, and we have less co-stimulatory receptors. And we have also less co-stimulatory signals by the antigen-presenting cells and the T-helper cells. So this is already the first limitation to the B-cell response. Then we look into the germinal center, and we know from mouse studies that the maturation of these follicular antigen-presenting um, cells is delayed. So at the very beginning, there is none or very little, and then it only comes by time. And there is less T follicular helper cells as well. So this means the response in the germinal center is limited, right? And when we say limited response, so what comes out of the germinal center, you remember, is either cells that produce antibodies, they are called plasma blasts when they're in the blood, and then they're called plasma cells when they're in the bone marrow, or it comes out Memory B cells. And memory B cells, do they produce antibodies? Yes or no? No, they don't produce antibodies right away. They need to be reactivated, stimulated to then become cells that produce antibodies. So this is what comes out of a germinal center. In, in neonates, we know that the antibodies wane over time very quickly. So in mice, there are studies that have been shown that there are some factors that are lacking, etc., in the bone marrow niche. And in human infants, we just see in the blood, right, that antibody levels, they go down very quickly and they don't stay high. And this is why we give more vaccine doses in very early life compared to adults. And what is important, that is the differentiation of these B cells. They are more in favor of memory B cells in early life compared to cells that produce antibodies and also extra follicular. And now if I ask you the quality of antibodies that do not come out of the germinal center, how are they? Are they good? Are they less good? Are they less good? And when we say less good, we talk about antibody avidity, no? They are lower, for example. And the, exactly the, the maturation process, right, is different. So we need to undergo several rounds to get really strong binding, uh, perfectly shaped antibodies. So in summary, when we compare the adult um, uh, germinal center response with those of, the, of a baby, we have, I really like this bar thing, right? So we have limited activation. We have a restrained T-cell, uh, restrained repertoire in the germinal center of the newborns, kind of the food, right? It's very monotonous, always the same. So delayed maturation and a lower number. And the antibodies, they don't last as long, right? When we need to feed babies every three, two hours. I mean, I can tell you, um, adults a little bit less. And, um, well, the differentiation preferentially is into memory B cells compared to uh, what we have in adult life, where we have boosting of our antibody responses and long-lasting antibodies in the plasma cells that are in the bone marrow. So what does this mean now all 
or vaccines. You have heard before that, you know, we have this window of vulnerability when we have here the scale of months in age. We have this blue one here as an antibody titer and this yellow one who thinks, who knows what the blue ones are at birth? Maternal antibodies, exactly. And then the yellow ones are the antibodies that are induced um, after uh, vaccination. So how we can close this window? You have heard the talk before. We can vaccinate mothers. No? So we get transfer of maternal uh, antibodies. Um, and just to add to the discussion, so um, in Switzerland, we vaccinate against pertussis already at the beginning of the second trimester. One is the antibody transfer uh, is higher, what we know, because if you vaccinate two weeks before delivery, the mother needs to make antibodies and then it's really late. So you get also more chances, as we talked about um, the colleagues from London or from, from England, um, that you have more chances uh, to vaccinate the mother and to increase the coverage, right? So you vaccinate mothers. And then what you do then, you vaccinate also the children. And coming back to the question before is um, that was raised uh, about if we need to vaccinate um, children uh, and when. So the, the aim of the childhood vaccination is to vaccinate as early as you can because it's the difference between passive immunity and active immunity. You know? So the transfer from nurses antibodies is passive and they're going to be eaten up, as we heard. But then you want the child to have its own machinery to make antibodies or to have at least membrane B cells. And so you need to vaccinate them. But then if you vaccinate really early, you are in this kind of state that I showed you where the child tries to not respond to everything, but still then can respond. So there is uh, some reasoning to why we wait if we can for months. Or mostly, mostly it's two months where we start the first vaccination because then the immune system of the child and the Tighter of maternal antibodies are in a way that it it acts well together. Right? So I show you a little bit after that. So we have early life immunization. So the questions that we have to ask us is: Can we still optimize even further the vaccination schedule? I'm going to talk just a tiny little bit about this because Edwin's presentation is going to be about different vaccine schedules in the past, current, and in the future. What is the influence of maternal antibodies? You have heard before. I'm going to touch on this subject just a tiny little bit again on pertussis because I think all of us, we think it's a really important vaccine. And at the end, I'm going to show you just one slide about if there is early life adjuvants that might for the future help us to have vaccines that would allow us to have better immune responses and perhaps fewer doses for early childhood vaccination. And again, mouse data, <laughs> So this is a study I would like to show you that has been published uh, a while ago now, um, where we had mothers vaccinated during pregnancy, either with diphtheria tetanus or with diphtheria tetanus pertussis vaccine, two groups. And then the children were immunized with this three plus one schedule. So um, vaccination at two months, four months, six months, and then the booster dose at 12 months. And then they had blood sampling at birth and then at the time of all vaccine, primary vaccines, one month after the third primary vaccine dose. Why one month? Because we always think this is the peak response that we can see one month after the dose. And then one month after the booster dose. And then they looked in two different antigens. And here you see the tetanus and diphtheria uh, antibodies really high because mothers were vaccinated during pregnancy. So this is maternal antibodies. And then after a month, low titers and virtually very little response to the three primary vaccine doses. But then we give a booster dose and then we have this rapid increase in antibody titers, which kind of is a sign that there was some memory B cells, no? because these memory B cells are the ones that become very quickly antibody producing cells and they increase very quickly then. And then they looked into Haemophilus influenza B and no surprise, not a lot of antibodies because for one, no vaccination uh, in this vaccine that the mother has received. And the similar to the tetanus and diphtheria, practically no antibody response at the beginning here, one month after the third primary dose. And then 
a really high response after the booster dose. And then, obviously, the aim of the study was to look also into pertussis, no? So then they looked into pertussis antibodies. And what you can see here, the, the uh, red dots, the squares, were the mothers who have received the deep tap um, or the, the pertussis vaccination during pregnancy and the blue ones not. And here is the response one month after the third dose and one month after the booster dose. And you can see that there is no antibody response after the first and then there is a tiny or there is an antibody response after the second and the third dose. But these antibodies wane and then they increase um, after the booster dose um, only. So the booster dose is important to then confer uh, antibody protection um, or antibody responses that are long lasting. But what you can also see here is that this, what Janet talked before, this blunting of, of antibody responses after the maternal vaccination. So you see that antibody titers are lower uh, in mothers and offsprings of mothers who have been vaccinated here compared to those where mothers have not been vaccinated. And this is something that is seen uh, and has well been described. It is sometimes not seen anymore after the booster dose, but it shows that it's important to give this booster dose at a 12 months of age to kind of catch up. But what is most important is the clinical relevance of this. No? I mean, this is nice. We go in the lab and we test these kind of things. But what do we want to do? We want to vaccinate mothers to prote protect the babies after birth against neonatal pertussis. So neonatal pertussis is in the first weeks or first months when the vaccination hasn't taken place yet or the antibodies are not yet, or the baby hasn't responded with antibodies to the first or second dose. So we kind of achieved the goal that we don't have neonatal pertussis anymore, but now the question is, do we have problems with pertussis later on? And there is very few data, and I'll show you something which is so iffy scientifically, but it's an observational um uh, finding from Australia that I thought was really, really interesting. So in Australia, um, children get vac or got vaccinated at the time of this um, study uh, in two, four, six months and at 18, at 18 months. And you would expect that if you have um, a blunting of the infant response to vaccination, that you have a decrease at the beginning, which is the effect of maternal antibodies, so no neonatal pertussis anymore. But then if the children doesn't res don't respond really well, to the vaccination, you would have a rise in cases, no? That's what we would think. So if you see what they saw as a landscape, so this is 2010 to 2014, before introduction of maternal vaccination, you see here this peak in cases of um, neonatal and early life pertussis, and then you have here kind of the baseline. And in the bottom, you have um, the cases after introduction of the maternal pertussis vaccination. And what is really interesting, I mean, it shows here again, as has been shown from several other countries, that there is a decrease in neonatal cases, but there is no obvious clinical effect of the blunted antibody response so far. So clinically, we don't have the impression that it's doing harm to later on in life. But the mo most important thing is to protect babies from dying, no? I mean, I we all talk about those we have seen. I, I don't know. I have seen several, despite ECMO, right? Who who didn't? I mean, who died, um, which is absolutely tragic and easily preventable by maternal vaccination. And now, in the last minute and a half, I would like just to show you um, a very busy slide to give one conclusion at the end that there might be something. So you see that there is a lot of pathways and that you see here a lot of different, sorry, a lot of different adjuvants um, that act differently um, uh, on, on a cell. And you see all the red things. It's like in neonates not working so well, but there is two kind of pathways where there might be some candidates and there's even more, right? But these ones I would like to show you um, where uh, it has been shown in mice uh, that there is an induction of uh nearly adult-like um, responses, and, and it's um, adjuvants like TRL7 and 8 agonists, which you can uh, see here, um, and uh, such as CAFA1 or some Dectin and Minkel agonists. So this is just to show you that there is research going on, 
that there is some candidates that has have been shown in mice. And it shows you that perhaps in some years I'm coming here and I'm as happy as Janet was to talk about RSV vaccines and that there is something for neonates um, that would help us to have better uh, vaccine responses. But you have to invite me again and again, you know, every year, just to be sure. So to conclude the objectives of this talk, you have seen um, that uh, early life vaccination is important um, because neonates and infants they are especially vulnerable to infections. Um, you have seen that there is specific requirements at different stages in early life to the immune system of a baby. And it is not immature, right? But it is totally adapted to what it has to do at different ages in, in its life. You have seen some of the early life regulatory mechanisms. Um, so it includes immunosuppressive molecules, immunosuppressive cells, and re regulatory B and T cells. And you have seen that the early life germinal center response compared to adults is different. So early life germinal centers have lower number of dendritic cells and T cells, lower number uh, or decreased B cell activation, and you have a preferential differentiation into memory B cells. So you have lower antibody titers. These antibodies, they wane more quickly. And what we said before, also their avidity is less good compared to adults. Something you might want to keep in mind for some hours. Um, and if you apply these concepts um, to early life vaccination and infant vaccine um, schedule, um, so we need to continuously assess if there is a need for additional um, priming or, or booster doses in light of, um, of maternal vaccination. And this is just a little kind of trailer before your coffee break to then see Edwin's presentation afterwards, who is going to talk about uh, more the infant um, vaccine schedules. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm, I'm happy to take your question. Okay, yeah, 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 sure. Um, please. Yeah, thank you for this very nice presentation. I wanted to ask uh, about BCG uh, because it's given at birth mm -hmm. and you have explained the immune profile of, mm -hmm. the, of the newborn at that time. Mm -hmm. Is it is it the right time to give mm -hmm. the BCG at the time? I know that the exposure yeah. and the risk of infection is very high, mm -hmm. but still, how do we expect the baby to respond? Because mm -hmm. it's a T cell response that is expected. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. what are, what are your comments? Yeah, about? I mean, I think it is really important to see in which context you give the vaccination, right? And uh, we know that if you give it really late, it doesn't really work anymore. Um, so there is countries who have the chance to not have to give it anymore. But if you have to give it, I mean, you have to give it early, you have to be, the patient has to be there. Once it gets out of your hands, that's another another problem. And it's a vaccine that has been shown to still work quite well, despite this uh, kind of limitations that I've shown you. It's also some things that I showed you is also very theoretical, as we saw, said before, right? So there's lots of immunology. And I mean, we like to think and then we make it really complicated and it sounds as if, you know, it's like, but at the end, if you see, you know, you have your patient, you have to vaccinate the baby and you have to do everything to protect it from uh, from having um, TB, right? Yeah. Okay, maybe just for, will it be better to give it later? When the, but then there's oh. also the risk of exposure, oh, no? And yeah. it also needs some time to work, so I would not touch the... Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, please, over there. Oh, it's, yeah, it works. Um, we introduced the maternal... Pertussis, I think, in 2016. I'm not sure. But anyway, like what we did is we uh, decided to give the woman who receive a maternal uh, vaccination to skip the first dose of the 3 plus 1 scheme. So the women who receive a maternal um, pertussis vaccination mm -hmm. get a 2 plus 1 mm -hmm. starting at 3 months. And the ones who don't get uh, the maternal vaccination get the three plus one. Um, until so far, we don't see 
uh, maternal um, the the pertussis going up is kind of but what do you think from the perspective so, of immunology yeah so can yeah. I, I i'm not sure if i really follow so you have the mothers who were vaccinated and then you start the first vaccination of the child at three months instead yes. of two months and we give it two plus one instead of three plus one that, so you give one dose less when the mother has been vaccinated exactly and the, and also the, it's also a little bit the incentive for the women to take the vaccination well of yeah. course that is not the most important thing but yeah. it's a side Plus nudge, I would say, they say, yeah. okay, if you give it, if you take the vaccine, you, you spare one for, yeah. for your child. And how many, um, neonatal pertussis cases did you have before introduction of the, because I mean, you know, yeah, to see, I, think uh, a signal every year, I think every year around 20. Yeah. I would say, um, and I think now, well, since COVID, there's nothing, but we yeah. have this Bible belt where there are many unvaccinated yeah. people only in those pockets. You sometimes have those uh, little, uh, yeah. epidemics. Yeah. Not with the vaccinated people, yeah. but still, it's like I mean, I logically wonder... wise, yeah, I'm logically wise. It's an interesting point to say that you want to wait a month more because you know that the half life is about 30 days of these antibodies, and then you have lower titers when you give the childhood vaccination. But what you do at the same time, it's a combined vaccine, no? so the children have not access to the other vaccines at the same time, no heap, no other um, antibodies. It's a um, Political, uh, I would say, with some kind of this. Is it's, I don't want to interfere with any decisions that have been um, taken, but for me, um, giving the vaccine at two months and you give the next dose at four months, for example, um, these children have a month more to produce their active immunity, even if it's a bit less. Um, but then at the end, you see that they still have a booster response, and also they can start having the first cells against uh, tetanus and etc. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I can hear if you need some arguments to convince the mothers, but the main argument is. The first month of life where you can't vaccinate, this is when you help when you get vaccinated during pregnancy, and this is when your child is, might die, right? If you if yes. it is contaminated even by family members who have been vaccinated because you know it's not, you know, this doesn't work as well. Yeah, yeah. but it's a, it's a very interesting question, and I mean, immunologically wise, obviously it's very yeah. yeah because practical. the first yeah, you showed that the first exactly. one gives quite this blunting effect, so it's like seeing me. It's yeah. not really adding much to the to the well but you, yeah you don't yeah. know if you wouldn't give it exactly so, like, it's, 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 yeah. yes and no it's just yeah. if you measure antibodies you don't see anything exactly. um, but it yeah. doesn't mean that there is no memory b cells because you know every vac like antigen exposure is leading to memory b cells and there it's difficult i mean at to study memory b cells in these one month two month old children because the amount of blood you can get is, is, is little but you see that the, when you give them a dose and then long term later you give a booster dose it is a booster response which shows you that there was something it's just you couldn't measure it no. right? yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah thank you um, now I have lost track about who was first but I think somewhere in the back I have please uh, uh, thank, thank you me <laughs> it's, it does, it's several I think okay. I have time <laughs> uh, uh, thank you I have a question regarding hepatitis B vaccine yeah. in early life mm -hmm. that is only given within 24 hours of life after that, they, uh, the second dose is given in three months. So what is the reason? I mean, it depends on the country. Um, there is countries uh, who give it uh, not at all at birth, um, but start at the with the combined vaccine at two months. And then there is countries who give it at birth and at one month and at 12 months. It depends on first um, if there's a risk for the mother to have had hepatitis and the child can you know, be infected or not. So you would do it at birth. That's what we do in, in Switzerland. No? I mean, it, it depends really on the um, uh, epidemiology of hepatitis B and then how you decide to vaccinate. Um, I think in the US, you give it at birth. Um, we in Switzerland, every mother is screened for um, hepatitis B during pregnancy. So we know who needs to get it at birth with active and passive vaccination or who, which child might be exposed and if the child has a risk of exposure at very early life, you want to vaccinate it at birth. And then you will wait for a month, two months or three months, depending on the country, when you give the next priming dose. And then you need to wait at least four or six months. The later, the older they are at 12 months to have a booster dose to have then long lasting antibodies. But it's a very country specific um, decision, unfortunately. Um, yes, please. Oh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, in, in, in the countries where I work, uh, the low and middle income countries, the only vaccine that is given to pregnant women is tetanus toxoid. Mm -hmm. So number one, I'm wondering, is it that uh, we have lower lower burden of these other diseases in pregnancy? And then number two, in the slide that you showed that the immune response at six, six 
two to four and six months is dampened but increased in uh, mm-hmm. 12 months. Have you done similar uh, studies in uh, these other countries which use wholesale pertussis mm-hmm. vaccine in children at, and they don't get the maternal antibodies at yeah. birth? So is there any difference and why is it that... We are only giving this vaccine in one part of the world. Is it an issue of money? Yeah. No, I so I mean I, I, I cannot um uh I mean I have the experience from you know, kind of the European area. Um but so what I can tell you is that, that there's a huge difference uh, about the wholesale uh Pertussis vaccine and the acellular vaccine. Um and the acellular vaccine is not working as well. Um, and so this is why after introducing it in these uh, European or Western countries where parents wouldn't vaccinate anymore because there was fever or something after wholesale vaccination um, and that just stopped it completely. And there were lots of cases. There was this acetylar vaccine and it kind of works, but we know now that it doesn't work really well. And this is why we saw, again, a rise in cases here where we have neonatal pertussis. We have adolescents that are sick again. And so we have introduced doses now for adolescents for pertussis. And now we have to vaccinate mothers to protect neonates because this vaccine uh, is not uh, producing so many fever or something when you give it, but then it doesn't unfortunately work as well. So I'm not sure if it's a, I don't think it's a question about money or not money, but it was a question in the Western countries to give this vaccine because the other parents just didn't want to vaccinate anymore with the whole cell vaccine, which is a... So the issue is that the Western countries may be using the weaker vaccine. Yes. But then I don't know about um, about uh, surveillance data on neonatal pertussis um, in in other countries, right, who use the, the whole cell pertussis vaccine, but we didn't have these problems. It didn't seem to have them before. Uh, and we in Switzerland was introduced in the 1990s. And, uh, you know, we saw a rise in cases around 2010 or something. I don't know if somebody else. Yes, please. <laughs> Yeah, so we just, well, we didn't just complete. It happened during the pandemic, but um, I have, have data in a completed manuscript that we will submit doing that study in Mali. And as Jan showed, Mali is one of the 12 countries in the world that has not eliminated neonatal tetanus. So we did a randomized trial where we compared TD to Tdap in pregnant women in Mali, and then the babies on a six 10, 14 week schedule get DTWP. So we did show efficient transfer of antibody and that protection in the early months, but we saw what looks like more of a blunting, which is not surprising because the vaccines are giving sooner in these children and it's whole cell pertussis. And the problem in a place like Mali is there is no booster on the schedule. So your last dose is at 14 weeks. So this will be a risk benefit trade off. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have... Yes. So I was just asking like during the neonatal period, the window period that was shown when the maternal antibody lasts and the vaccine immunity is still to build. So with the maternal immunization, as you showed that the antibody, maternal uh, antibody will last longer. But doesn't that mean that the vaccine, we need to delay the first dose of vaccine a little bit because there might be interference again. Mm. I think yeah. maybe the ne- in Netherlands, that's why probably the, they are doing that. Yeah. So at the end, like if we, if the maternal antibody lasts longer, then yeah. the first dose of the infant immunization probably needs to be a little later. Mm-hmm. It's so, a very good question. Um, and uh, there's lots of thoughts and, and, um, there's the theory and, and a lot of, I mean, that's why we want to optimize the vaccine schedule. The thing is we vaccinate against some antigens, but not against all of them. So, and then we give this combined vaccine. So we vaccinate against tetanus, diphtheria and pertussis in during pregnancy, but then there is no IPV and there is no uh, hemophilus influenza and the babies are at risk. So if we delay for some antigens, the vaccines against other antigens, this is a, a huge, um, I mean, benefit risk balance we have to take. And this is why we need more data to see if there's a clinical effect on the, of this blunting, because, you know, you can measure it and yes, the antibody titer is lower. But for example, for pertussis, we don't have a kind of a threshold or we don't have a correlate of protection. So even though I, we measure it and we say it's lower, we don't know how much we need to be protected. So it's it's kind of a thin eyes dangerous decision to delay um, the vaccination um, for some antigens because we think it might interfere until we don't know it really has a clinical impact. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, but it's a very, I mean, that's what we think all the time kind of about and asking about if you need additional doses and, you know, and the question is what we want to protect most for. Yeah. Um, there's a question up there, please. 
Thank you. Um, so is there an immunological reason why vaccines for Hep E, Hep B, um, OPV and I guess BCG can be given much earlier than for the others? Um, I think it's more of an epidemiological um, and a convenience in some other, uh, in some countries you need to give it because you need to protect as fast as you can. Um, then it, you need, but also to give additional prime and booster doses to have really a long lasting uh, immune response. I mean, not for BCG, but for if you talk for hepatitis B. Other countries where the exposure and the risk to be exposed to hepatitis B is lower, you can wait to give a combined vaccine or even you can wait until adolescence uh, to give the hepatitis B vaccination um, then. Yeah. I'd like to make just a quick comment about your really good question about pertussis in developing countries. So when I came to the Gates Foundation, one of my plans was to try and make an affordable uh, DTAP that could be given to pregnant women to protect babies from pertussis. And we even spoke about doing a number of randomized trials. But before you do a randomized trial, you have to figure out what's the disease burden so you can figure out how big your trial has to be. And so for the last five years or six years, we've been funding studies looking for pertussis in neonates, and we find almost none. So just as you suggested was the case, when countries are using whole cell pertussis, there is a very small burden of early pertussis. It does occur, it's, it's circulating, but it's not a major public health problem from what we can see. And pertussis is seasonal, so you have to do studies for a long time. But as I say, we've been doing it for like six years now, and we really haven't found significant pertussis. So for better or worse, the whole cell pertussis vaccine seems to be controlling pertussis largely, even in kids too young to be immunized.